Thank you. Um, my name is Gavin Griffiths. I'm the author of The Accidental Pornographer, an inspiring story of failure. <laughs> now, before I tell you my story of failure, you need to understand the environment back in 2002 when all this started. Because otherwise, the whole thing sounds wildly irresponsible. <laughs> it's 2002, tail end of the dot com boom, except we didn't know it was the tail end of the dot com boom. Everybody in London thought you could do anything. My generation had stepped into the limelight, and there were untold riches to be made if you had the balls. You came up with an idea, you raised some cash. You launched, you started burning your cash. And I was in the middle of this hotbed of entrepreneurial frenzy. I worked as a senior manager for a dot com. We'd raised about 50 million quid and had managed to spend nearly all of it. So you see, with this as a backdrop, it doesn't seem entirely unreasonable at the time to meet quite a well known writer and TV pundit at a drinks party, quit my very well paid job to join her in buying a distressed erotic media firm for a quid. And there it is. So what happened? Well, I must point out at this stage, I had no money. I was 30, just married, mortgage to the hilt, spent what I earned every month, no rich parents in the background to bail me out. The whole thing was entirely speculative. Now, seasoned business types amongst us will know that buying a distressed business for a pound actually isn't that hard. The reason the seller is giving you the business for nothing is because he wants shot of it. He wants out. He wants to offload his debt. And that's the bit you've got to be careful of when you buy bankrupt businesses, because if you're not careful, it can ruin you before you even start. So I come home triumphant to the wife. And I say, <laughs> I bought the erotic review for a pound, and I've quit my job, and I'm going to make a million. And to which she replied, that's wonderful, darling. I'm pregnant. <laughs> a little background. The woman at the drinks party was one Rowan Pelling, editrice of the erotic review, an erotic magazine that had been going for about four years, made a bit of a name for itself. And she explained that it was a sleeping giant that had been <laughs> chronically mismanaged. I think if I can find a partner to buy it off the existing owners, we could make a lot of money, she said. So we did it. We acquired the business, we took all the debts, we mortgaged our houses, both chucked in 25 grand. She set about getting the next issue ready. I went out there, tried to raise a couple of hundred grand to see if we could run it. And we got lots of PR. The press loved us. It was a great story. Two mavericks had bought the erotic review. We were looking for an investor. And we contacted everybody we knew trying to find some money. And eventually, after a lot of dead ends and false starts, we found a trio of very, very rich chaps. And we're talking super rich. We're talking the kind of rich that doesn't appear on the Sunday Times rich list. And they loved the concept, and they liked us, and they put up the money. And one thing I will always remember, as we were concluding the investment, they said, do you think 250 grand is going to be enough? <laughs> of course it will. But of course it wasn't. Now, because this evening is entitled Business Nightmares, you can assume that this doesn't end well. <laughs> and you'd be right. Summer of 2002, we sallied forth with our 250 grand, highly optimistic, pathologically optimistic, and became unstuck almost immediately. The business was essentially built on a subscription model, with a bit of money from advertising and a bit of money coming in from selling it on the newsstand. But the money comes in from people buying subscriptions to the magazine. And the plan had the following assumptions. You run a direct response advertising campaign. It does really well, and the money comes in. You take that money, and you reinvest it in a new direct response advertising campaign, and that does really well. What was not mentioned anywhere in our plan 
was what happens if your first three advertising campaigns bomb? <laughs> if they only bring in 30% of the revenue that we'd forecast? We had no provision in our business plan for things not working out. There was no headroom at all. So we valiantly tried to stem the flow of cash out of the business. And we tried to increase income by coming up with little money-making schemes, like selling sex toys. My mother was so proud of that one. <laughs> we also set up a little website called poshtotty.com, which was a site where posh ladies took off most of their clothes. I didn't even tell my mother about that one. <laughs> Now, none of this was really enough to prevent the inevitable. And by the spring of 2003, a year in, we had angry creditors banging at the door. I'd stopped drawing a salary, and we were looking for a buyer. We took it to IFG Publishing, run by James Brown, the guy who set up Loaded, who loved it, but they were having their own cash flow problems. Richard Desmond, the press baron, liked it. But eventually, Felix Dennis, the legendary proprietor of Dennis Publishing, snapped it up. Now, we didn't actually go bust. And in the end, it was a reasonably simple acquisition. But had it been a week later, it would have gone under. So it was the skin of our teeth. The investors got back half their money. The magazine was ab absorbed into the Dennis Publishing fold. And I was fired. Nicely fired, but I was fired. So whilst I was spared the public shame of going bust and the team kept their jobs, it was a massive personal failure. And I'd ended up selling the business to one of my heroes. And it wasn't supposed to be that way. So I followed an idea I'd wanted to develop whilst I owned Erotic Review, and I launched Scarlet Magazine. Now, Scarlet Magazine is a slightly raunchy women's glossy, and we launched that in 2004, and I sold that business last year. It was significantly more successful than the first one in terms of market share and turnover and satisfaction, and I didn't make the same mistakes. I actually found a whole new raft of mistakes to make. <laughs> and I took the business from zero standing start, me with the phone, to a million pound turnover and when we sold it in 2007. But it wasn't going to make me the fortune. And although I loved it with a passion, it really needed to be part of a bigger stable. So, so I sold it. So what now? Well, opportunism. <laughs> After that, I launched Cosmetic Surgery Magazine, which is the only consumer cosmetic surgery magazine in the UK. And it's doing rather well. And here's the lesson I learned. It's not necessarily about what I wanted to work. It's about what the market wants. And it took me quite a few years to get that. So I have no real passion for cosmetic surgery. Um, I haven't actually had any. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a viable and robust market in a, in a troubled time. So that's what I concentrate on. And the future is really is, is slow calculated expansion using my calculator to guide me and not my heart, which is a bit of a shame. Um, when looking at the notes about this evening, I was asked to give you some suggestions about current climate um, and, and what entrepreneurs should do. And I would say just act swift, because this isn't the end of the world. Walt Disney and Hewlett Packard both open for business in the Depression in the 1920s. Microsoft started during the 1970s oil crisis. There are opportunities out there. Be nimble. Think what people want in a downturn. Most book publishers take six months to a year to turn around a book. I wrote this in December, printed it over Christmas, and it hit the shelves on January the 1st, and it's selling like hot cakes which of course it would. A true entrepreneur wakes up every morning knowing that opportunity and threat lie around the next corner. Let's hope tomorrow morning it's opportunity. Thank you.